It need not be said, although one will do so now for the sake of narrative convenience, that imperial justice is nothing if not thorough. Those who transgress against the Lex Imperialis, against the word of the Emperor himself, are dealt with in the most punitive of terms. The pain is often the point. Equally as often, the visibility takes precedent over actual guilt. After all, innocence proves nothing. As is the way of regimes such as ours, the masses must never be let see that transgression is even possible. Under such rigors, the concept of the recidivist, those who have previously sinned and yet live to sin again, is abomination, presenting a fundamental threat to the sanctity of the very concept of the Lex Imperialis. Thus, they must be dealt with in equally fundamental terms. The Imperium has ever had within itself servants capable of meeting out such judgments, but during the days of the Great Crusade there were altogether different ways those of us in the present era can scarcely comprehend. Know then, that this is a record of the justice of the Emperor and the doom of those who sought to defy unity. A record of the Eighth Legion's actions in the Vnori resurgence. The Imperium of the early Great Crusade was a frontier state. The manifest destiny of humanity was a thing untested. Despite the words and deeds of the Emperor of Terra carrying forth his armies across the reclaimed wastes of the throne world, the galaxy it would soon be powering out into was a chaotic wilderness beyond even the scope of Old Earth's recently concluded conflicts. The regimes that had survived the passage of the Age of Strife had been hardened by its traumas. It has been remarked that a great many philosophies of the human past had been ground to dust and death by the horrors of old night, preserving in their stead human polities governed by insular, paranoid, or deeply militaristic regimes. Not often were these governments or societies easily given over to surrender to another. Their independence was one earned through bitter survival struggles. The compliances of the day were oft tenuous. The alliances struck were oft fragile, and the oaths sworn were done so under, shall we say, less than fulsome degrees of mutual trust. The Imperium expected much, and despite the Emperor's stunning successes thus far, he was, to many, but another warlord with delusions of grandeur. Questionable loyalty was, for many, the way of things in those early years, and despite what the propaganda reels expounded across the Imperium's steadily growing domains, rebellions were not uncommon. In the vast majority of cases, these insurrections were put down with minimal fuss and minimal loss of life. The Imperium, after all, needed manpower and materiel, and sought where possible to be at least somewhat restrained in its reprisals. In certain cases, however, revolts were treated altogether differently. Suppression of recidivism was no longer an option. What instead must be wrought was horror, so total that any who dared to even think of raising banners against the Emperor would simply be too terrified to do so. Vnori was a city-state, but not one on some far-flung sphere. This enclave sat on Terra itself, once a part of the vast Pan-Pacific Empire. Where once Old Earth's mightiest ocean had covered, the remaining desert wastes contained in their reaches vast crevasses that plunged deep into the planet's crust. Within one of these was nestled the metropolis of Nori. 
While hundreds of kilometers around the crevasse was given over to the city-state's vast, sprawling tendrils, its heart lay within the canyon itself, with armored buildings dug deep into the flanks, extending kilometers deep below the surface. The light of either sun or moon reached its deepest Stygian depths as a suggestion of a glow, both from sheer distance and the coating of a miasmatic cloud that formed the atmosphere of those deepest depths. Putrid human reek mixing with the gaseous outflow of such a vast, industrialized conurbation. Vnore was one of the last strongholds of the unification-era regime of North and Doom, who had risen to power sometime after the passing of the unspeakable king, that was said also to have continued his predecessor's legacy of tyranny. Doom earned one of the rare honors of the day, execution rather than imprisonment. The people of Nori had been loyal to their tyrant to the very last. The rule of the raptor and lightning bolt banner sat ill with them, although, for all intents and purposes, the city had acceded to the diktats of unification. In sullen silence, the trench metropolis had lain submitted since the fall of the pan Pak regime. That was until the coming of the Crimson Walkers. Scattered historiography is all one has to piece together precisely what the Crimson Walkers were. Their origin is occluded, of course, but in the litanies of unity their presence appears in enough sources for a somewhat coherent picture to emerge. They were, as can be best ascertained, a cabal, comprised of a motley grouping of genetic atrocists, psyker things, and brutish warlords. However, their sundry oddities belied their absolute lethality. It is difficult to grasp within words the unbelievable horrors of Age of Strife and later Unification War era Terra, while certain revelations about the fundamental aspects of our universe may eclipse the terrors of Old Night in scale, it should not be forgotten that the Age of Strife birthed a thousand thousand horrors, forged in witchcraft, gene lore, blood psychana, and plain, simple human cruelty. The greatest of these horrors came to rule pockets of the human homeworld, forging legacies of blood and pain, and in their toppling the Emperor sought to unshackle the human species from the grip of monsters. Yet the Unification Wars were nothing if not messy. Despite the best attentions of the Master of Mankind, something always managed to squeeze into the dark cracks in the world, retreating into the shadows to plot and scheme. Traces of the Age of Strife lingered even past the Declaration of Unity in 712 M30, the formal end of the wars. Clone revenants, witch breeds, fanatical viziers, fugitive lieutenants, remnants of a myriad of deposed and slaughtered tyrants, still survived. It was inevitable that, in time, these individuals would find each other. Encounters that developed into a twisted kindred, fused by hatred of the Emperor and his works. Together they struck devil's bargains, this miscellany of nightmare leftovers, driven by a thirst for revenge against the Aquila. Bit by bit, resources were gathered, and connections were established, a web stretching across Imperial Terra. Resurgence was inevitable, and when it emerged, it did so in Venori. The Crimson Walkers found the Canyon City a willing ally state, one that had never in its heart truly acceded to the Imperium and had simply been looking for a better master. The Cabal's influence over the city grew steadily, at first in secret and yet then more openly. It was a headquarters of sorts, as, bit by bit, the horrors of Terra's past began to emerge anew within the city. Flesh forges into which cultists willingly threw themselves, blood harvests to which ostensibly loyal imperial citizens gleefully submitted, throngs 
of the half-dead, some of whom had never even known the rule of doom to begin with. Rather than shunning or fleeing before these renewed horrors, the people of Vnori, by all accounts, willingly submitted to the Crimson Walkers. As the records put it, such as an abused beast may return to the beck of a wretched master. Those that resisted were merely given over to the Cabal's most debased members to be canvases upon which the worst genetic and psychic atrocities could be wrought, fuel for the Cabal's foulest dreams. It was too long before the word of the city began to reach Imperial authorities. Legends of the time said that it was the master of mankind himself who crafted the response, and he did so in but three words. Send the Eighth. The Eighth Legion Astartes, later to become known as the Night Lords, were a legion of dark renown even in the Imperium's earliest days. The first recruits that can be reliably traced to the origin of the Eighth were drawn from a series of linked subterranean prisons deep within the crust of Terra. At some point in Old Earth's history, a regime had developed the idea of giving over vast caverns below ground to incarceration facilities, effectively creating self-contained city hives filled with their society's criminals, political prisoners, or general undesirable elements. In such lightless, lawless environments, the rule of the blade was the only one that existed developing ersat societies of utterly ruthless individuals. Cunning cruelty was the only thing that such people could depend on. The constant influx of new prisoners from the surface hives created a steady stream of both victims and opponents. The Astartes that had been drawn from the deep dark of Terra's sins were not only supremely vicious killers by their nature, but men drawn to a form of moral absolutism that expressed itself in a desire for vicious, punitive actions. Merciless Astartes were they, creatures born of night and condemned now by character and creed to live within it. And this suited the Emperor perfectly. When transgression against the writ of his Imperium was perceived, his Eighth Legion would be there to see that retribution was enacted. The Eighth Legion did not immediately react to the Master of Mankind's summons to Terra. Presently engaged as they were in some last final acts of the immediate post-Solar Reclamation, the force of the Legion that remained within the light of the Sun numbered a little over 500 Astartes, an amount that, conventionally, could never be expected on its own to overwhelm a metropolis of some hundreds of millions of people. This, however, was seemingly not even considered by the Eighth. The Emperor had summoned them, and they would answer. It took some time for their preparations to be concluded, but when they had... A sustained orbital bombardment of Venori was the first sign that Imperial Retribution had come for them. For six hours, Turbo laser bolts and inferno munitions pounded the city's sprawl from high orbital anchor, leaving in its wake a circle of fused molten metal, a kilometer-wide zone of hell that penned all those living within the city into its confines. To the skies, the eyes of Venori's defiant citizens were now cast. They knew the dawn would bring the Imperium. But the dawn never came. Rolling in over the city, there came a cloud of blackest pitch, a great shadow that swallowed the metropolis whole and blocked wholly the light of Sol. Then came the rain, deluges of water drenching the city from whatever cloud had been seeded above it. The water bore with it a foul chemical tang, and the people of Venori found themselves becoming dizzy, losing control of their extremities to convulsions, but noticing all the while their senses were becoming both warped 
and heightened. Every sight was crystal clear, every sound crisp as a knife edge. The longer these effects lingered, the more it felt to the people of the city that their ears were deceiving them, hearing voices where there were none, glimpsing movement from the corners of eyes that wept painfully. The rain fell for a day. There was no dusk to herald the coming of the night, for the black cloud yet held the hive within its clutches. The citizenry began to withdraw into whatever scraps of perceived safety they could, fearing terribly the shadows that whispered to them or flickered on the edge of hyper-real vision. From the deep darkness below, the Eighth Legion emerged. While the black cloud of their making had unleashed its narcotic deluge on the city, the Astartes of the Seventh had deployed from its cover into the crevasse at Venori's heart. Plunging at terminal velocity down its deep, dark canyon, they triggered their jump packs only at the last possible instant to arrest their descent. As the day passed and night began to fall, they had lain in wait in those same depths, clinging to the rock walls like chiropteric mammals. Judging the moment apt, they now rose like chthonic things upon columns of flame, jump packs powering them up from the darkness, breaching the city's lowest reaches in fire and fury. Butchering any they found within, the Eighth Legion laced several of the lowest hanging towers with demolition charges, triggering a series of explosions that set off others throughout the hive stacks and wreathing the lower reaches of the city in fire and thick, acrid smoke. Setting about the population, the Eighth enacted torture pogroms, the screams of the dying now beginning to echo up the canyon as the population, already half deranged with fear, began to lose their minds entirely to terror. The Crimson Walkers were not, of course, without their response. Against the invaders, they unleashed a horde of utter monstrosities. Stitch golems, fused flesh hulks made from a dozen distinct human bodies, scampered around on innumerable human hands. They flung their hulking forms at the Eighth Legion, seemingly feeling no pain. Elsewhere, hordes of brain-shattered husks, their sunken glassy eyes betraying the work of the stimulus probes sunk into their exposed craniums shambled towards the invaders. Hundreds died as the bolters of the Eighth Legion reaped amongst them, yet turn back they did not. Floating in the air, their extremities twitching arrhythmically, Psyker thralls summoned warp lightning to hurl at the Legion. Gunfire clashed with sorcery or tore into flesh, and for all the myriad horrors the Cabal could summon, onwards the Eighth Legion came, weaving through the air upon jump packs and slicing flesh-wrought horrors with lightning claw and chain blade. Summoning more maneuverability than many could have thought possible from such brutish contraptions as Astarte's jump packs, the Eighth were unstoppable evading the worst the Crimson Walkers could summon and pinpointing their strikes with apparent ease. Augmented from their helm vox grills came the screams of the dying themselves. It had become a common, ghoulish practice of the Eighth to record the pained howling of those they tortured and butchered to be played back later in battle as a psychological weapon. The city was now fully ablaze, a charnel house of monsters fighting monsters, lit by the fires of burning buildings and ringing to the sounds of gunfire, monstrous howling and the screams of those already dead. Into this inferno, drop pods now fell as the Eighth Legion deployed its reserves from orbit. 
These freshly arrived Astartes joined the chorus of the damned, adding to the wailing of the dead of Venori, those slaughtered by the Legion in a previous campaign. A cacophony of sins past, now brought to those who dared sin again. Terrible though the forces of the Crimson Walkers were, they were few, and they were disparate. Ever an alliance of convenience, as opposed to genuine conviction, the Cabal, when placed under duress of having to actually engage the Emperor's Astartes, began to fracture as the individual war criminals and lunatic geneticists began to look after their own ends. Some, in desperation, turned against their fellows, attempting to gain control of facilities, technology, or test subjects, all to better aid their survival or escape. Indeed, many attempted to quit the city entirely, a presence there being nothing less than expediency in the first place. None succeeded. Hounded by Astartes in midnight blue, their retinues of loyal retainers or mine-shackled thralls were blown apart by bolter fire or torn asunder by chain swords. Each one trapped within the canyons of Venori ultimately found themselves before the impassive, blood-stained gaze of Mark II Helms. Those Crimson Walkers had managed to flee into the blasted and burning circle of devastation that the Eighth Legion had carved around the city, found themselves now prey to Seeker squads. The Legion allowed many of them to run, knowing they were being hunted for hours, occasionally maiming or injuring their quarry, but never killing them. All who managed to make it that far were eventually dragged back to the burning metropolis as piles of broken, bloody, but still conscious, meat. With Venori in ruin, the screams of those civilians now utterly maddened by fear ringing between the burning buildings. The Eighth Legion gathered on the canyon's edge, now appearing for all the world like a yawning, smoke-clogged mouth of the Inferno of Dante. Their injuries patched, their wounds maintained, the Crimson Walkers were there gathered, healed to consciousness, their eyes open to see what was coming, their mouths unstapled, that they may howl their fear into the black sky. The Eighth Legion offered no words of judgment. The Emperor's writ was clearly delivered by their actions alone. One by one, the Legion threw each Cabalist into the canyon. Before the first had hit the bottom of the crevasse, the Legion detonated demolition charges placed at key structural points on the buildings that hugged the rocky walls. Venori simply fell into the canyon. The remaining structures plunged into the burning pits just as the Crimson Walkers did. As the 8th Legion watched, Helms betraying nothing, the screams of an estimated 10 million survivors that had remained, sheltered from the Astartes' attentions, filled the air, reaching the sky, joining the Kabbalists in final moments of agony. The dawn came, sputtering and weak. Of the Eighth Legion, there were no signs save for the devastation they had wrought. What wretches yet lived within the bounds of what had once been Venori did not do so for long. They died knowing that the justice of the Imperium had come, and it had been terrible indeed. Ave Imperator. Gloria in excelsis terra. This video and this channel 
were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculusimperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching. <laughs>